Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And what I want to do in my eight to ten minutes is um, just tell you a few words about why we think you should vote yes on Measure 92. And to start, I just want to tell you my personal story, why I am in, involved in this. Uh, my background is mostly in nonprofit uh, health agency management. And most of my adult career is with the American Cancer Society. I spent 21 years with them. The last five here in Oregon, that's what brought us to Oregon, I was the uh, exec executive vice president of the Oregon division of the American Cancer Society. Uh, until I retired three and a half years ago, I worked for seven and a half years with the Oregon Physicians for Social Responsibility as the project director of their campaign for safe food. I just want to make clear, I am not a doctor, I am not a scientist, I have just worked with them uh, throughout most of my life. Uh, and the purpose of that campaign was to take a good, solid look at genetically engineered foods, and are commonly known now as GMOs, and that's what we did. And I can tell you just from our point of view that we did not think that they were proven safe uh, for human health and the environment, and we took that message to the public. And this story, however, though, and, and this is until I retired three and a half years ago, when the campaign started, they called me and they said, would you like to be involved in this labeling campaign? I was involved in the first one back in 2002, and I said yes, so I am here as a volunteer today and very proudly representing this campaign. So, uh, in a nutshell, our main point is we think that regardless of how you feel about genetically engineered foods, uh, fine with them, not fine with them, we think you have a right to know what's in your food, and that is the purpose of Measure 22. And I want to do one quick check on definitions here, because this can get confusing. We are not talking, we're talking about genetically engineered foods, or GMOs as they are commonly termed, uh, we are not talking about what farmers have done for hundreds or thousands of years, which is hybrids of the same species or very similar species. That's not what we're talking about, and that's not what this ballot measure refers to. It refers to what has been done in the last 30 years, which has been forcibly injecting a gene from a completely different species uh, into another plant or animal. Uh, something that can only be done in the lab and not done out on the field. So that's what we're referring to here. As far as reasons why, we'd just like you to know that already, already, 64 other countries have already put in place the labeling of genetically engineered foods. They have done it without any increases at all uh, to their food cost to consumers, even though the same companies that say, you know, you're going to have a real big increase in food, food cost to consumers, uh, they said it back then before the, um, all these other countries did it, it never came to pass. Uh, so they're doing it without any food cost increase. And American companies are already labeling for export labels with genetically engineered food on them. They're already labeling that to the, for these other countries for export. And our point simply is, if they can label it for these other 64 countries, they can simply label it for us. Another big reason, I mentioned this before, pesticide use. You may have heard this, that all genetically engineered crops have led to decreases in pesticide use. No, that is not accurate. They have actually led to increases in pesticide use, and they're probably all familiar with Roundup, um, Monsanto's best-selling uh, crops, uh, and they got uh, Roundup ready, which means that they won't be killed if you put the uh, pesticide Roundup on them, but everything else will be killed. And there's Roundup ready soybeans and Roundup ready canola, and this is where you get in processed foods, uh, almost all of your processed foods, 70 to 80 percent of the processed foods in the grocery stores, are, do have genetically engineered ingredients in them. Okay? Pesticide use has increased because weeds have become resistant to Roundup. They are either applying more and more, or they are applying more and more 
uh, different pesticides on them. If you've heard of BT corn, there was an initial decrease in that, but one thing you have to understand about BT corn is that every cell inside that corn has the pesticide itself. If you eat that, you are ingesting a pesticide, the pesticide BT. So they may not be applying as much on the outside, but you're getting it on the inside. I also want to tell you about genetically engineered salmon. Salmon are an iconic fish here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, I can tell you right now, it is in the pipeline for the FDA to approve genetically engineered salmon. These have been genetically engineered by taking a gene from an eel-like fish and injecting it into these salmon to make them grow faster. Already, we've already got labeling to tell us if salmon are wild or farmed, because a lot of us want to know, okay? But when the FDA, if they approve this, and we're very afraid they will, they are not going to be requiring genetically engineered salmon to be identified. If we pass this law, we will require that. And I think that's what a lot of people want to know. The safety issue I brought up, uh, I can tell you I put in thousands of hours studying genetically engineered foods, the safety, and I did come to that conclusion. At first I thought they were okay if the FDA said they were okay. I thought, all right. And then I started really looking and found out all, many, many scientists are, do not believe that for a minute. I saw a lot of animal studies that were indicating uh, very serious signs. We're, I'm not going to go past the science in many of these cases. There is not absolute proof that they are harming human health, but what there is is a lot of scientific evidence pointing in that direction. And until it's been demonstrated safe, uh, I do not want these, uh, I would prefer these products not be out in the market. Now, a lot of them are. And a lot of you may disagree with me and say, well, I think they're safe. And that's perfectly fine. All we're saying is all of us have a right to know if they're one way or the other. And I do want you to know this because most people don't. The FDA does not do any safety testing on genetically engineered foods. The FDA does not require any independent testing on genetically engineered foods. The only safety testing that is being done is by the same corporations Monsanto, Syngenta, Dow Chemical, and the others. The same corporations, they are the only ones doing safety testing on these genetically engineered crops. And all the FDA does is sign off and acknowledge and say, you've done the safety testing and it is your major responsibility. <coughs> now this is about as obvious a conflict of interest as I can ever imagine, but I just want you to know what the FDA's minimal role in this is. In terms of farmers, oh, please close, okay. Uh, I just uh, want to say this, in terms of costs, um, there is quite a few things I'd like to say on that, but the main point is we have a right to know what's in our foods. This is a very clear labeling, very short, genetically engineered ingredients that anybody can understand, and we think we have a right to know wherever you stand on. Thank you. When you're actually speaking, 10 minutes goes extraordinarily fast. Everybody who's ever done that knows that. Uh, basically, for the opposing viewpoint, Kim Pullman is here. She um, helped launch the Splenda brand worldwide for Johnson & Johnson. And she uh, is a um, nutrition scientist who has some views on this. So I have uh, Kim Pullman come on up here and take your 10 or so minutes. the opportunity to talk. Um, you know, I, my background is science and that usually means snooze and really boring, so I think you guys have taken a huge risk by uh, giving me some extra time here. So I would like to say that actually Rick North and I are in agreement about the number one major thing. 
everyone deserves the right to know what they're eating. I'm passionate about that, and I agree with that. My argument is that that, that mechanism already exists. And I've got some, some, I brought some food boxes to show you just how it's already incorporated. And I would use his statistic as well that 70 to 80 percent of what you eat is genetically modified. Most of the genetic modification comes in the form of wheat. Um, and we're a big wheat consumer. Well, we do, um, we eat a lot of bread, pasta, and everything else. Uh, as far as its risk, there's so much I could disagree with with Rick. I do think it needs more study, but there's an awful lot where we could disagree. Rather than that, I'm going to stay focused on whether or not the label gives you enough information to make an informed choice, and I think it does. So if you assume that most of what you're eating is is genetically modified, and people will call out when it's non-GMO. We have a little sticker that, you know, or get animated and see what happens. <laughs> uh, we have call what the industry calls call-outs, and I've got some examples that I'll pass around here. The first one, if you'll notice, it's calling out zero trans fat. It's calling out zero, uh, it's wheat and gluten free. It's kosher. None of these are mandated by law. It's done to let you know what you're eating. And if you're looking for that, there you go. So that's the first one I'm passing around. And that's the almond nut thins. <coughs> the second one I'm passing around, actually, the second one I'll pass around is organic diced tomatoes. It's got the USDA call out button on it. So if you want to know if it's organic and pesticide free, hey, not a problem. You've got it, you've got it covered, right? The non-GMO verified is a white circle. It's usually found in the lower right hand uh, portion of a box and it's a white circle with a check, and it says non-GMO verified. So there is a mechanism, just like these things that I'm sending around where it calls out anything from kosher to organic to USDA uh, certified, um, it, it can call it out. You also have an opportunity, like the uh, Orville Redenbacher Smart Pops, to call it out on the label. And it says right here, um, non-GMO corn, for instance. And food manufacturers can do that to, to, so they already have a lot of ways of letting you know without any more legislation going on. Uh, my business partner has a, a great way of describing it. He says, when you go to a football game, you know who the cheerleaders are. They dress different, right, for one thing. He said, if you turn around and look at the crowd, you don't see people wearing shirts that say, I am not a cheerleader for the non-GMO. And, and I agree with that. You don't, you don't have to wear a shirt saying, I am not a cheerleader if you're at a football game. There's plenty of ways to call it out. And people will call it out to see because if there is a demand for non-GMO. They will use it, they will put it in their packages, and they will, um, and they will uh, let people know that that's what's in there. And if people are interested, that's what they can buy. The second thing where I deeply disagree with Rick is it won't cost any more money. I am part owner of a small food business, and I am here to tell you that we have looked at the packaging costs of what would happen, and it would be devastating. I currently don't export our product because of the, requ the requirement and the labeling change and all the verification back, 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 back that I would need to do. So when they say that it won't cost any more, I've got serious issues with that. It will cost more, in, and some of it might be soft costs where we don't export, you know. Uh, so markets are closed to us. 
you know, it can be that easy. And I use non-GMO soybeans, <laughs> you know. So it, let me tell you, it does cost more. And the, where this really hurts is the most vulnerable members of our society. People have to eat on a budget. If you start raising their food costs with legislation and things that may or may not be important, then, then I think that's a real tragedy for anybody, the working poor, you know, I mean, a lot of it is, you know, the thought process, let the meat cake. I mean, at some point, food has to be affordable, safe, and nutritious. And when you start adding in a lot of the a lot of legislation, okay, if if Oregon requires that I have to to label it, um, then I have to reprint my packaging to to relabel, and I also have to or exclude Oregon. Maybe I just won't sell in Oregon. You know, that would be a cheaper way for me to do. And then I've got to tell my distributors, is this is legal for sale any place but Oregon? One of the strengths of our nation in keeping our costs, our food costs lower and safer is having a homogeneous type of food shipment system where we can ship from state to state and it's not an issue. So for Oregon to have a separate law than the others would be, would be incredibly burdensome on small food companies. Maybe it won't matter to the big guys. Maybe they can ship internationally and have 22 people to look after just the, the uh, labeling requirements alone. I can tell you as a small producer, those, those costs are burdensome. And it would affect the price. Of the, of the food, and that does harm our, most, our people most at risk. It is very hard to feed a family on a budget if you're the working poor. And uh, you know what? Genetically modified may not be your biggest roll down. You might just want to give a teenage boy enough food to eat and have it be reasonably nutritious. So, you know, that there's that. Uh, as far as the, the science part, like I said, I'm going to um, rest on that because one of the things that happens as a scientist, I can definitely tell you this, the minute science and emotion collide, the scientist always looks really, really bad because, you know, there's, there's one of these things that, you know, just says um, you're trying to you know, you're trying to do evil and couch it in scientific terms. And so, <laughs> you know, that, that, uh, that isn't, isn't the case either. Um, certainly, one of the things that the biggest genetic modification that happened was done in the spirit of feeding millions and millions of people, right? He got a Nobel Prize for it because uh, it, he came up with drought-resistant wheat that yielded 10 times more wheat than, um, than any other wheat. India and China adopted it, and then American farmers adopted it. He saved millions and millions of people from a, a death from starvation. So, um, you know, that, that also calling it into conflicts of interest into question is also kind of difficult. Many people just want to feed people at a, at a cost they can afford um, and nutritious foods. And there is a roll down from, from healthy eating. For instance, organic versus, uh, organic versus regular. I was in Costco this weekend and uh, Organic bananas are 62 cents a pound. Non-organic are 49 cents a pound. If you're faced with feeding a family on a budget, what's going to be your bigger roll down, that they eat bananas or they, they eat organic bananas? So anyway, I'd like to leave you with two points, two very critical points. You have a right to know what you're eating, and that mechanism already exists with our current labeling laws. Calling it out and making something separate is not going to do anybody any good. And the second is, if 
you do decide to go with the labeling. The people you are putting most at risk are the people who are already struggling to afford good food. So please, please think of them when you're doing your votes. Thank you. Thank you. At this point in time, we're going to do our two-minute rebuttal situation. I forgot to thank Karen Bo uh, Bolin, who basically, once we canceled this, and was able to come up with the idea and also invite um, the, the folks from um, Home Style Fresh LLC to appear. So I, so I thank uh, Kim for preparing a short notice and also Rick. We'll let Rick go for a short period of time, two minutes or so, with no hook, hook or crook to uh, rebut this, and then Kim comes up for two minutes and we open up for questions from members of the forum. Thank you. Um, Kim, I'm sorry, you've got some information that, that's just totally wrong. Uh, first of all, when you said that 70 to 80 percent of all the food sold in grocery stores are genetically engineered, that's not correct. It's 70 to 80 percent of the processed foods. The vast majority of fruits and vegetables sold in grocery stores, uh, meat, uh, dairy, like, is not genetically engineered food. So I want to correct that. Your bigger mistake is on genetically engineered wheat. There is no genetically engineered wheat. That has never been approved. This is a matter of public record. There is no genetically engineered wheat approved for sale in the United States or anywhere else. So I don't know where you're getting this information, but it's totally incorrect. In terms of being able, uh, and this is a matter of public record, anybody can just go to any website you want and, and find this out. Uh, in terms of your argument, you can just go into a grocery store, you don't need it, that this is superfluous or redundant, uh, that's not correct either. Uh, I'll just give you an example. I went into the Freddy's in Tualatin, and I looked at uh, typical foods, Kraft macaroni and cheese, Kellogg's Raisin Bran, uh, Prego spaghetti sauce, uh, things like this. And, um, and they've got ingredients on the side listed and um, not labeled, of course. They're identified but not labeled. I asked five different workers at Freddy's, five different workers, they said, can you tell me if these are genetically engineered or not? And they had no idea. These are workers in the grocery stores that did not know. Then I went to the produce section. The produce section, corn, yellow squash, papaya, all have been genetically engineered. And of course, they're not identified. I asked the workers, any idea if these are genetically engineered? No. I've been working on this for 10 years. There's no way I could tell if they were genetically engineered unless they're labeled. This is not to put down the employees at Freddy's or like grocery store workers any place else. They were very nice and they were very helpful. But there is no way they could know if those foods were genetically engineered and there was no way I could know either. And on the costs, let's just look at these costs. Because as I've said, the same industry, the biotech industry, the big grocery industry, Pepsi and Coke says, oh my God, you're gonna have these giant increases in prices when they did this in Europe. They had no such increases. It cost virtually nothing to relabel a package. Most companies relabel, redo their packages on a typically a year-long basis anyway. To put in like four more words costs virtually nothing, okay? If you don't believe me, go to our website, oregonrighttoknow.org, and you have got a article in there from Scott Faber. Scott Faber used to work as a lobbyist for the grocery manufacturers of America a main group opposing us. He has since come to our side, and he said, this argument doesn't make any sense at all. He said, uh, companies do this all the time. Now, to your point, I would acknowledge, yes, for so, some companies, uh, they are gonna have increasing costs if they, if they change and go to GMO free. That, you know, that may involve different supply chains, so I would acknowledge that, that that could happen. And nobody can predict exactly what's going to happen with prices. There are so many factors in, involved in pricing. Uh, brand competition, retail store competition, raw materials, labor, transportation, energy costs. Nobody can say exactly what is going to happen in the future. 
But I can tell you this, we've already had three examples. We've had Cheerios, we've had Grape Nuts, and we've had Ben & Jerry's ice creams all go GMO free, they have changed, without any increase in prices to the consumers, all of them. So I'm sorry, uh, we have seen no evidence whatsoever of price increases to consumers. Thank you. Ms. Coleman. I think you have a fine example of, of people disagreeing because I disagree with most of what, what Rick said, you know, um, working backwards first because that's how I can remember things. Uh, you know, Cheerios changed, they didn't change a thing. There are no genetically modified oats in the, in, <laughs> so again, I think we're probably disagreeing on plant hybrids versus genetically modified. Um, but the main, I think it comes back to the main thing of what the legislation will accomplish, which is do you have enough information, if, if genetically modified matters to you, we've all been eating and it's, and it's true, we, everybody who eats dies, you know, I mean, <laughs> but if we're, if we've been eating genetically modified for quite a long time and it's been working for you, you know, and you might have other roll downs of things that you're concerned about. The question remains is do you have enough to, enough information to make your decision um, about what you want to eat on the label? And I would argue yes, and that there, that those who want to um, call out genetically modified on their label or non-genetically modified label have the means to do so. And the second that we deeply disagree with is on the costs. Um, again, I can speak from my own experience and from the experience of other food owners. Like I said, it might be different for large corporations, but for middle and small, um, we don't repack, we do, do our packaging every year. And would it really help to say, you know, may contain GMO ingredients? Uh, you can assume that already. And, and then if not, you can have the non-GMO verified sticker in the, in the corner. And that would, that would do the same thing. And that is a, that is a third party certification that is available to any food manufacturer willing to go through the process. So, you know, that's pretty much. <laughs> okay. Because we're going to have questions, you all Okay. Okay. Questions are open to forum members only, exclus exclusively. And uh, we have um, Eric Squires, Bill Kroger, and Lee Coleman, and John Hutzler are all forum members. And I've identified them. I assume they're going to identify themselves before they ask their question. So um, it's on. And away we go. Uh, speakers, my name is Eric Squires. I'm a forum member. I ask each of you to respond to this. We have a new set of diseases that have popped up, uh, and conspiracy theorists think that it has arisen in concurrence with genetic modification. One of the increases in disease is uh, celiac disease and ulcerative colitis. Conspiracy theorists think that that may have something to do with uh, genetically engineered food, and I'm wondering if each of you has an opinion on those gut diseases and genetic engineering of food. <coughs> I'll take a uh, first stab at this. There, there, it's pretty new in science. I would be willing to argue that we don't really know. There are a whole host of factors that could be in. We do so many things differently nowadays in addition to eating genetically modified foods. Um, it could be anything from we, we also exercise less. We have different flora and fauna in our microbiota. You know, so much of your digestion is carried out by the bugs inside that it, you know, what's a, who knows what's affecting those. Those are very poorly understood. So I would say that it is a very, very new area of, of research and we don't really know. 
that certainly genetically modified foods need to be studied along with many, many, many other things. Um, so I don't think anybody really knows. There's interesting hypotheses. What does scare me is that the pseudoscience on the web, people will attribute things and, or uh, quote things or just plain old make things up. And that you cannot stop with research just reading the web. There have to be some other things, um, some other data points involved. So that's how I would respond. Thank you, Gail. Uh, I somewhat agree with Kim uh, on this. There really, uh, I don't think anyone can say for sure one way or the other on this. And one uh, you didn't mention was uh, like autism. I think we've seen that. My, my wife was a special ed uh, before she retired, uh, specialist in kids with learning disabilities, and worked with a lot of autistic kids. And she saw it. I mean, she saw it over the last 10 or 20 years, this tremendous increase in autism. And that's, that's been brought up, too. Uh, uh, correlation is not causation, necessarily. Uh, that's true. And uh, we really don't know. Here's what we do know, though. Uh, we do know that the Codex Alimentarius, which is the UN's main food safety body, has determined that genetically engineered foods pose different kind of risks to human health than traditionally, uh, traditionally bred ones or hybrids. We do know that. And we also know this, there have been plenty of animal studies done that are showing uh, definite differences, what's going on. The most controversial one, and then one of the most recent one, was one done in France. And it was showing that rats, and it was a long-term study, which are just not being done here in the United States, long-term. And these rats were coming up, the ones that were being fed uh, genetically engineered food, uh, were showing tumors. And they definitely want to do more research on this, especially the long term, because they're typically being cut off if they're being done in 90 days in the United States. So just based on what we've seen, and again, I'm not going to go past the science, but my feeling is better safe than sorry. If these things have not been demonstrated safe uh, beyond a reasonable doubt, they shouldn't be out there. Uh, they are out there. Uh, I think the least we could ask for is they're labeled so we can make an informed decision. Uh, I think we have a right to know, and people can disagree, and that's fine, but at least everybody would have a right to know. Thank you, Rick. I'm uh, Bill Kroger, a forum member. Thanks for coming, both of you guys. I, uh, this is not specifically GMO related, but, but uh, uh, farmers and ranchers have been ingesting, at least I read about this, ingesting antibiotics in animals and stuff to, you know, for obvious reasons. And it's getting into the human population, and it's making, from what I read, it's making antibiotics less effective, over, you know, over time. And I'm kind of wondering if this new law is going to have anything or address that at all. Uh, Bill, thank you for the question. No, it doesn't. Uh, the, but you're absolutely right. And this, this, by the way, is a huge problem. Just, just to add on. We're getting tremendous increases in antibiotic resistance. The ones we've been using are not working, and this, this is a major public health issue. I will say one non-GMO statement. Uh, a lot of you may not want to hear this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, much of the meat produced in the United States is coming from factory farms, and the, cow, the, the beef cattle and the pigs are being, and the chickens, are being just forced in and being in very, very close quarters, and there's a tremendous amount of chance for infection then. And especially in the beef and the pigs, they're being given antibiotics in their feed to try to hold off the, uh, the infections there. When that happens and we eat these, that can increase antibiotic resistance uh, in us, and it's also in the soil and the water around these. So uh, that is a major problem, um, not GMO directly, but I just would throw that out there because it's something that I used to work on with Physicians for Social Responsibility and worked with a lot of national organizations on trying to um, stop this practice of putting the antibiotics in the feed. Lee Coleman, forum member. Uh, one question for 
each of you, a separate question. Um, first, uh, the FDA does have a, a, a requirement that it must determine that products are safe and effective. Does that specifically apply to food? That's question number one. It seems to me that uh, when the FDA banned the use of di uh, uh, diethyl sylvesterol uh, in meat, that uh, settled the question. And, and uh, on, on the no side of the question of labeling, I must say I don't get the, the cost issue. I, I don't see how putting an asterisk uh, to say that the food does not contain GMO uh, is not all that costly, especially as long as you're uh, contracting for labeling uh, on your packaging. Anyhow. So your question uh, regarding the FDA and does it require the safety of food? Uh, when genetically engineered foods first came up for review by the FDA, uh, they came up with this term saying that they were substantially equivalent to traditional foods. That's not really a scientific term, it's just a term that they came up with. Uh, I, I would strenuously disagree with that, and so does Codex Alimentarius, the UN's main food safety body. But, uh, but to, you would have to see, and I'd be happy if you want to give me your email, I'd be happy. This is, again, it's a matter of public record. And I can just get this and send it to anybody here that wants to see it. Uh, Monsanto develops a genetically engineered crop. FDA doesn't do safety testing, no independent testing, just Monsanto. They send a letter to the FDA saying, well, we've done these safety tests, and we, we state that they're safe. What the FDA does is then send a letter back to Monsanto saying, okay, well, you've done this and this. Um, okay, we acknowledge that we received that, and we acknowledge that you have said that they were safe. Just want to say, and this is like the last sentence or two, uh, just to reaffirm, it is your responsibility, your as in Monsanto's, to say that these are safe. This is what this is what the FDA says. So again, I can just send this to anybody. I, this is this is the state of affairs in the U.S. government. I mean, the, the substantially equivalent. You've got the FDA saying they're the same. You know, really no difference whatsoever in these foods. You go across the street in Washington, D.C., and you've got the patent office, and you've got Monsanto and Syngenta and Dow Chemical going to them and say, well, these are completely different. We want these patented, this uh, Roundup Ready soybeans, Roundup Ready canola, BT corn. These are different. Well, look at what we've done here. And then they get granted a patent saying that they're different. So you've got one arm of the U.S. government saying one thing, one saying the other. And you wonder why somebody like me that worked in this field you know, looking at this and quickly changed my mind on how confident I was about the safety of genetically engineered foods. Sounds but it, like a lawsuit. Uh, uh, but, but again, the main point, again and again and again, you don't have to agree with me. It's okay. Uh, all we're saying is you got a right to know. I've dealt with the FDA a lot, and there's a lot of problems with the system, and I'm in agreement with, with a lot of the things that you say. However, I do know that they work to take public health very hard on a same thing, a limited budget and a limited resource. What you're talking about is food chemicals are, are dealt with completely different than food stuff. I mean, food chemicals have to go through, you know, preservatives, dyes, things like that have to go through quite a lengthy Question proposition. Question for you is, uh, uh, the cost of labor. Oh, and the cost, I can give you chapter and verse, same thing. If you would like an email, I, uh, we do not print 
our packaging every year. We do not, if we want to change a supplier and go, then we would have to also review the labeling for a change. Every time we run a small run for our labeling, it's $28,000, and that would be just to change four words on it. Then if we want to change a supplier, we'd have to make sure that our packaging is still compliant with that, with that supplier, so that's another cost right there. Um, then we would have to segment out Oregon, you know, from other, from other people if we decided not to change our labeling costs. That's another cost. To be that Oregon has different laws than every place else in the nation, so that's another cost. Um, and everybody has to be doing the care and feeding of these laws. So that's another cost. It's not like you just pass a law and then think, oh, it's automatically absorbed into a corporation. Somebody's got to be tracking that and making sure that you're in compliance with all the different laws coming down the pike because there are significant uh, legal changes. What you can put on the front of the package, you know, for instance, the weights and measurements, you know, the, the nutrition facts panels, you're tracking all of those things. Um, and the legal burden of putting out uh, food, and incidentally, I'm pretty proud of our food system. We've got one of the safest food systems in the world. Um, so, so that's, and it's come a long way. It's come a long way. So, um, you know, but, but a lot of that is, a lot of the legal part of it is making sure that your package is in compliance with the law, and that takes a lot of time and money. So, so yes, reprinting packaging, even on a small art design change, is, is expensive. And then the care and feeding of that package to make sure it's in compliance and that you're in compliance with the laws continues to be a cost. I am in agreement, though, with Rick. What matters is if you have enough, dis n enough information to make a decision for your own eating and hopefully those less fortunate. John Hutzler, forum member. Um, in, in, regard to the, in regard to the cost of labeling, um, it seems to me it's partly a question of who bears the cost. Um, if uh, uh, in order to use the mechanisms that, that you've described, Kim, the producers of non-GMO foods bear the cost of not only labeling that they're non-GMO, but also the verification process that you mentioned. But, but for someone who, who processes foods that include GMO, it's simply a matter of identifying that on the label, that this may include GMO. There's no requirement to verify that, in fact, it does include GMO foods. Am I correct? I mean, the, 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 cost, the, cost, of those, the cost of those who would, who would label that their foods may include GMO would be far less than the current cost for those who want to identify their foods as, as non-GMO. Yeah, yeah, and I, I would say, just as a quick clarification, why people are doing it is to see if there's market demand for it, so that's why they're calling out the non-GMO, is to see if, if it is a concern to people, if it matters. So, to that degree, consumers bear the cost, and to a large degree, that's someone who shops at Whole Foods or New Seasons is not going to expect the same pricing that they might do if they shop at Winco. Okay, so, so that cost is passed through clearly to the consumer who votes with their dollars. Um, the rest of it the may contains uh, GMO ingredients, Yes, it's one line, but where you put it on the package, um, and like I said, the care and feeding, what are all the other laws that go with that? But those, but those laws are there regardless. You know, so, so, so that, those are where the costs come in, the increased costs 
I would, you know, they're at the very minimum, everybody would have to reprint packages. The question is, would I have to landfill my old package and have a cost there, et cetera, et cetera. Would, there's a lot of other things, you know. Okay, Kim. You just said everybody would have to reprint packages. Let me ask you, is your company completely non-GMO? Yeah. It isn't, okay, so you would have to. All these, all these companies, food companies, that are selling what you've identified is this is the way you can tell we're non-GMO certified, we are organic, they don't have to change a thing. They don't include genetically engineered uh, ingredients. They don't have to change a thing, okay? Companies that are currently using genetically engineered uh, products and choose, you know, if this goes into effect, they choose not to change, and it's not going to be a wholesale change that everybody's going to go try to find non-GMO. A lot of people uh, are just going to go with the status quo, and they'll be okay with it. So they're going to continue to sell GMO products. All they would have is some little statement on there, and they do packaging, and they do. It's about about every year, maybe you do fewer. Okay, I can understand that and acknowledge that. Um, but just that is gonna cost virtually nothing and there hasn't been any product changes. Um, and the other thing, uh, just this, the poor, I I'm sorry, you know, if they're continuing to buy the same products with one little statement on there, the price, I, you know, again, nobody can predict the future exactly, but all we, all we know from the past is there haven't been any genetically any increase in prices whatsoever, and we just don't see it here either. Uh, and as far as the poor being hurt, I can tell you this: Consumers Union, who represents all the consumers of America, including the low income, they have endorsed our campaign. Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon, representing a variety of church and faith denominations in Oregon, who specifically look out for the poor. They have endorsed our campaign. This is the way to do it. And by the way, on Cheerios, just one thing on Cheerios, when I said about them not increasing their prices, you misstated what I said. I didn't say that oats were genetically engineered, they're not, but Cheerios was including GMO ingredients, whether it was soybean oil or canola oil or whatever, that's what they had to change. So it was not GMO free to begin with. They had to change it. <clears throat> Chris Leslie, four member. I really uh, feel that the genetic engineered plants have been around since the Incas up to Luther Burbank in uh, Southern California. We have tomatoes, potatoes, these are all genetically engineered in the true sense. I feel uh, Rick has been talking about uh, pesticides. That's more important. And organic foods, they either pass the taste test or not. And the lifespan has expanded. Where do you stand on these situations? These are definitions I feel should be addressed in your uh, proposal for changing our laws. Yeah, and, and the definitions are important because they can be confusing. Um, strict definitions, genetically modified, genetically engineered, okay. Uh, genetically modified, uh, absolutely, since the Incas, absolutely. Farmers have done this, they have crossed, uh, they have crossed uh, different, spe uh, different varieties of the same species, like corn. Corn started out, I believe the name was Teosinte, uh, in Mexico. And they started crossbreeding, and we couldn't, I mean, you couldn't even eat the stuff to begin with, or hardly, but you know, it, it developed into you know, a modern day corn that, that we're used to in eating. And the same thing with, with wheat, uh, different, different varieties of wheat crossed to provide better wheat. Uh, so yes, they have been doing that, but the difference is these are 
in the same species or very closely related species that could be done in the field, uh, sexual reproduction. The difference with genetically engineered or what is now being called GMOs is, uh, is this in about the past 30 years, they've been developed this in the, la in the lab and they actually, they actually take a gun, a gene gun for most of these and shoot a gene from a completely different species into, uh, into a plant to try to produce a desired trait. Uh, they have been successful in producing the desired trait, which has almost always been resistant to Roundup, Monsanto's pesticide, and I get to pesticides. Uh, so their, their theory is, okay, we'll shoot one gene in there, it's gonna change the DNA, it's gonna change the RNA, and it's gonna produce this trait that we want. And that's all that's going to happen, nothing else. And what we're saying is, wait a minute, there's all kinds of other uh, unintended consequences that can happen along with this that you're not doing any long-term studying or, or testing for. That is our major concern. And uh, so that is the difference between what's been going on in the last 30 years and what's been going on in the thousands before then. Pesticides are a huge concern. They have been increasing, not decreasing. And I can tell you right now, it's Dow Chemical. It's in the pipeline to be approved that they've got new crops. I think it's corn. I'm not sure. It may be soybean. I'm not sure on that. But that can be... Um, resistant to 2,4-D, and if 2,4-D rings a bell, it is one of the main components of Agent Orange that was used, this horrible defoliant that we used in Vietnam that produced all kinds of cancers and birth defects in succeeding generations. And this is what they want to add. We're on this pesticide treadmill that you use so much Roundup, weeds develop that are resistant to the Roundup, it doesn't work anymore, so they got to apply stronger and stronger pesticides and I don't know anybody that wants, goes into a grocery store thinking, I want more pesticides on my food. But this is what we're heading for. I agree that the issues are in the definition of genetic modification and who draws the line and where. Um, I agree with this. I'm not familiar with the whole pesticide escalation um, thing with Dow coming out, uh, I see a different sort of traits that people are looking for, you know, I'd like to ship my apples without them getting crushed in transit, you know, I see the more traditional um, things that I'm just trying to hurry the plant breeding along, you know, without having to wait for every single generation. That's the portion of it that I see. Um, that has has been able to give us arguably a safer um, crop in that way, you know, in terms of being able to weed out some of nature's really big extremes, um, you know, and it and it get, makes for safer processing and a safer safer food product supply in general. Both individuals said they'd be around for questions, but I think we're towards the end of our hour allocation. So I'm going to wind up. This is the presentation of the Washington County Public Affairs Forum. I'm its president, and uh, we are probably, next Monday we'll be bringing on a program with the Senate District. As everyone's aware, the legislature is um, uh, pretty close to 50-50 split in both sides, and we have two former incumbents, the one in the House and one currently in the Senate, who are challenging um, for the Hillsborough Senate District, which could be result in control of the Senate. So it's actually fairly important. We may be tagging on a house race uh, for the second part of the program. But that's it, and thank you for watching. This doesn't stop the questions, though. Both parties said they would stand by. We see former Oregonian reporter Harry Bodine. He's got a question. And if you'd like to answer it, it'll be off camera, though. But, but again, I'd like to thank Rick North and Kim Pullman for appearing to, um, on very short notice to provide us some um, information here. And to our uh, listeners and folks watching, um, again, thank you for your viewing.
Harry Bodine, the foreign member, with a short question. First of all, I want to get a uh, statement of uh, clear conflict of interest or lack of it. I've been married for 53 years, and for 53 years I've successfully stayed out of the grocery store. <laughs> my wife does the shopping, and so she's probably the one who should be here today. Anyway, my question though is this. We're here in this restaurant. What, what will the, this bill do? So I understand Oregon's the only state doing this, is that correct? No. Okay. Uh, well, no, that's other, well, Washington voted it down last year, other states. But we'd be the only one at this point. At no. the first one. No. No. First, what other states? Can I answer? Well, just one second. Okay. I started to get no, ahead of myself. Vermont has already, Vermont has already said, through their legislature, that they are requiring okay. labor. Okay. Yeah. Now, two other states have done it too, but they require other states to do it first. Okay. My question really is this. I eat out a lot in restaurants. What's this going to do to my restaurant meal tab? And what is, as the Oregon Restaurant Association um, as an organization taking a stand on this this measure? Uh, I don't know the answer about the Oregon Restaurant Association. They have not endorsed it, because I'm somewhat familiar with our list of endorsers. I don't know if they oppose it uh, or not. Um, no, this bill doesn't affect restaurant food. Uh, the, the foods covered in this, we try to keep pretty much consistent with foods that are already labeled, um, uh, already have like the traditional nutrition labels on them that, that you see in grocery stores. So uh, with the addition of fresh pr produce in grocery stores, that would be the one thing the retailers would be responsible for. If you got sweet corn up there, you have to put little signs, if it was genetically engineered, say genetically engineered, that's it on the shelf. That's what they'd have to do. Does not cover restaurants. Uh, does not cover bake sales. Kid delivers a pizza to your uh, house. Doesn't cover that. Doesn't cover dog food, um, cat food, any animal food, anything like that. It's pretty much consistent with the foods that are already covered by labeling now. I mean, I'm in a 100% in agreement with that, you know, it doesn't cover the restaurants. But I'm just amazed and a little heartbroken that you can go for 53 years and delegate <laughs> something as wonderful as going to the grocery store <laughs> to someone else. I, and that's one of my pleasures in life, is looking at, and one of them, you've got to admit, is seeing the produce all displayed with its beauty, beauty and, and thinking about what you're going to do with it. Ooh, you know, that's, that's terrible. Tell me you at least grill. Do you put stuff on the grill? Really? Rarely. Rarely. <laughs> Rarely. Hey, well, thank, Rare. Well, Rare, Rare and well done, sir. Actually, medium. <laughs> anyway. anyway, thanks a lot, folks. Looks like we have to genetically modify by shooting a X chromosome in there or something. But, but in any event, um, thank you for coming. We have a board meeting after, a quick board meeting, because I don't want to abuse people's time. Thank you for coming. We'll, we'll, we'll get more public relations stuff out, telling you what's on our... Um, scheduled next week and in weeks subsequent to that. But thank you for your time. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, John.